uh, if you like, uh, untrustworthy. Uh, politics was a dirty game. The people didn't really know uh, what the true interests of Ireland were. The people were enslaved. They had the slave mind. That's a real Republican catchphrase of that period and later. Sean McBride is very fond of it. Uh, we know better than uh, the ordinary people what is good for Ireland because we have earned Irish freedom with our blood. Therefore, we have the right to rule. Those people, they were pretending to, to have a government and pretending to have some right to rule the country, which they hadn't got. It implied that they were the only Republicans and, and, and that they had some brand of patriotism that others hadn't got. But we who sided with the treaty were yellows as Republican, just as Republicans they were. But they abused the, the very name, the very word Republican was abused around that, that period. They didn't know democracy. Uh, they were under British rule for 800 years and they were coming to the, rule, to the end of that uh, period of colonialism and uh, you know it, it has to be said that the British had very little concept of democracy when they were talking about Ireland so my father was brought up in an era where it, it was insurgency it was uh, uh, it was resurrection it, it was uh, in independence you know and uh, inevitably democracy as you and I know it now uh, takes second place to what you wish to achieve in a, in a, in a revolutionary sense Ireland was now sliding rapidly towards war. Mass meetings addressed by military leaders replaced political gatherings. Dialogue had effectively been silenced. Of course it was natural and sensible in the light of the history of Anglo-Irish relations for uh, Irish nationalists to distrust the British government, particularly a government headed by Lloyd George, the wiliest and most dishonest and treacherous and cunning of all British prime ministers. Of course, suspicion was natural, but in the light of what happened later, de Valera and the Republicans got it wrong. I think that de Valera has enormous moral guilt on his hands. I think in later life he probably realised it. He did say to Joe McGrath that it is my considered opinion that in the fullness of time, Michael Collins' reputation will go up and it will be at my expense. Indeed, Collins at this time was the one figure who might have held the situation together. He was active on several fronts, striking a deal with Northern Premier Sir James Craig to halt appalling sectarian murders in Belfast, pressing Lloyd George to accept Republican proposals on a draft constitution for the new state and resisting Winston Churchill's demands that the situation in Ireland demanded bloodshed, which he felt in the first place ought to be Irish blood. <laughs> Collins responded with political aplomb. He cobbled together an electoral pact with de Valera to present a joint panel of Sinn Féin candidates to the people in the election scheduled for June 1922. What Collins was trying to ensure was a vote free from intimidation or violence. If he got this, he believed, then the people's verdict would be very much in his favour. And overwhelmingly, it was. No less so because of his decision on the eve of polling day, more or less, to tear up his agreement with de Valera. The election results were a massive popular endorsement of the treaty, a majority of four to one in favour of the agreement. De Valera now knew that he was battling against a tidal wave of public opinion. Opposing the will of the people, he later admitted, is by far the greatest weakness of our cause. An already explosive situation worsened dramatically in late June, with the killing in London of Sir Henry Wilson, an arch enemy of Irish republicanism. Two Irish volunteers were captured at the scene. The British government responded furiously demanding once more that action be taken against those who were opposing the implementation of the treaty. Ireland's provisional government, under the leadership of Arthur Griffith, finally decided to act. Griffith might well have done so earlier, but for the influence of Collins. Dublin's forecourts had been occupied by anti-treaty forces since mid-April. These men saw themselves as a symbol 
the natural successors to the men and women of the 1916 Rising, who had seized the GPO in similar circumstances. Militarily, it was a cul-de-sac, but the Republicans, led by Rory O'Connor, were determined to make a defiant gesture of opposition to the provisional government and to the treaty. At 4.30 on the morning of June the 28th, Free State troops, using two field guns borrowed from the British, opened fire on the occupied buildings. Inside, the anti-treaty forces remained defiant, in some ways relieved that months of futile negotiations had finally brought Ireland back to war, albeit a war with itself. The inevitable outcome was the near demolition of the forecourts, and with it, Ireland's national archives, dating back hundreds of years, and of course, irreplaceable. An ignominious surrender followed, and the arrest of many of the anti-treaty leaders weakened their cause at the very moment when their leadership was needed most. At the start of the Civil War, the anti-treaty side held the military initiative, but pointless exercises, such as the occupation of the forecourts, meant that strategic opportunities were lost. Many such mistakes were to be made in the months ahead. Fighting now spread to the rest of Dublin, and soon half of O'Connell Street was in ruins. The Civil War was now well and truly on. Casualties began to increase. The fighting in Dublin left more than 60 dead, among them the former Minister for Defence, Cahill Brewer. Those leaders who escaped death or arrest fled south to continue the war, leaving Dublin smouldering but secure in support of the treaty. Provisional government troops swiftly pursued their opponents through Wicklow and Kildare and on to Wexford and Waterford. Rapid recruitment into the National Army and superior firepower meant that the advance was relatively unhindered. Where fighting did occur, casualties were fairly light. It was merely a matter of how long the pro-treaty advance could be delayed. In Limerick, pro- and anti-treaty forces have been involved in an uncomfortable standoff for months. But here again, the anti-treaty side, without artillery, were quickly dislodged. These successes for the provisional government put paid to the anti-treaty side's notion of defending a mythical Republic of Munster, south of a line from Limerick to Waterford. It had survived barely a month. Government troops followed their opponents into County Limerick, where a triangle of countryside defined by the towns of Kilmallock, Brewery and Bruff saw some of the fiercest fighting of the Civil War. Pressure on the anti-treatyites was increased when government forces landed by sea at Cork and Tralee. By the early part of August 1922, the anti-treaty IRA could not legitimately claim to control a single sizeable portion of Irish soil. As those who saw the fighting knew only too well, it had been a bitter struggle. I knew it would be rotten. Wish I could see that was only the height of folly. How were anti-treaty aids going to get a republic by shooting out the other men's brains? And how were the other party going to gain anything by shooting the opposite side? They were supplied with plenty of arms, both sides of them, by the English government. The judge was delighted with it. He said, they're doing, they're doing now what we aren't able to do. Killing each other. A pro-treaty officer still remembers the aftermath of an IRA sniper ambush along the South Mall in Cork City. So I went over to the men that were knocked out by the machine gun bus. And I, I uh, first of all, went to the, the door of the club 
which were kind of a portico with Grecian pillars, you know, and all that. And there was a soldier in there, and he was firing like this in all directions. The fellow was going to have his head out together, you know. And the bullets were ricocheting off the, off the pillars for all the world. Were. So I snapped the rifle off him and, and, and emptied it and threw it away. Told him, come on out here and help with the men that are dying. So I went out and, and mixed with the men dying, and two men died in my arms, as I said in actual contrition, into their ring. And the last word they said, both of them young men, only 18 or 19. The, the last word they said was, Mother. Both of them said mother at the same time. That was the last word that was said. They died. Straight up. There were four men killed, anyway. It was a sad period in Irish history. It was grand when they were fighting the British, but uh, fighting their own people was a different matter altogether. It left an awful lot of bitterness uh, down. Had he lived, he would have been a force for, on the one hand, firm military measures of the sort he had engaged in, and on the other, attempts to end the conflict with his old close friends. Events since proved that Collins was the man who made the right decision, and people who followed him made the right decision. And I think people who opposed him then, afterwards, realised that he, w he was the man that sh would have united the country had he lived. The provisional government's response to Collins' death and to the continuing guerrilla warfare was the imposition in September 1922 of martial law and the introduction of the death penalty for a wide range of offences. Well, it was a harsh time. I mean, the Civil War was harsh. It was brutal. And I think that has to be understood. As Minister for Defence, Mulcahy's rationale was that he wanted a policy in place, a legal policy, that would enable uh, courts of law to execute people who had been found guilty of atrocities against the Free State Army. And with such a policy, he hoped to control the Free State Army because he felt that if they didn't have that, 
then they would be more likely to take the law into their own hands. And that's what he wanted to prevent. They certainly brought, brought about the desired effect that they stopped the Civil War. I mean, Vivian de Valera is, told me that uh, his father used to say to him privately that if it wasn't for the executions, the Civil War would still be going on. I'm not saying that victory vindicates their actions or justifies their actions, but they were faced with uh, a horrendous dilemma. They responded brutally and effectively. And I don't think anybody would like to be a member of that government faced with the choices available to them. I think uh, the, the need for executions uh, faded very quickly uh, and that by the end of the year uh, no further killing was, ne was necessary on either side. But I think by then it's, a, it's the usual problem with wars, once they start they're very difficult to stop and I think everything got out of control. Uh, the Free State Army was only very imperfectly controllable by the Free State Government and of course on the other side the IRA were not controllable by anybody, uh, even Liam Lynch and certainly not by Eamon de Valera. One question will always overshadow the record of this first Irish government. Would Michael Collins, whom they succeeded, have adopted a policy of executions? I believe if Michael had lived, those events would not have happened. I believe the strength, the magnetism, the dynamism of his personality, would have had an influence there, but equally so. There was a government. The state was operating. Opposition to it, we can now say, looking back, without bitterness, was illegal. There were very tragic and sad things done on both sides. Uh, I think it showed a mean-spiritedness of the people that came after Collins. I'm talking about Cosgrave uh, and O'Higgins, Blythe and Fitzgerald. And I believe that had Collins lived that you wouldn't have got those excesses. I think he would have prosecuted the war in a vigorous way, uh, the, the Civil War, on behalf of the Free State. But I don't think he would have got the excesses of state reprisals and unofficial and official executions, or at least the extent of them. 77 people were executed during the war by a government described as unenthusiastic Democrats. By no means all their supporters endorsed this controversial policy. I didn't like it a bit. No, I didn't like it a bit. I thought it was um, too severe. But uh, in the executions themselves, there was very little selection as to who should be executed, I thought. You know, I didn't want to do it was a case of just proving an example that if you, if you break the law, you'll die, and that's it. There was more executed in the Civil Petty War in Dublin than there was in anything else. They took him out of Mount Chai and shot him. The fellows that were in, 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 in jail in Mount Chai, they were brought out and shot. You see, they got very bitter all together in Dublin. I was a soldier, and my job was to obey orders. And with a government elected by the people, I saw nothing wrong in dealing with men who weren't prepared to accept the rule of the people. The shooting of two TDs in early December provoked another sharp response from the Free State authorities. In emergency session following Sean Hales's death, the government ordered that in reprisal, four Republican prisoners, Richard Barrett from Cork, Joseph McKelvey from the North, Liam Mellows and IRA leader Rory O'Connor be executed without trial. The cabinet decision on O'Connor had caused Minister for Justice Kevin O'Higgins the greatest difficulty. Barely a year earlier, O'Connor had been best man at O'Higgins's wedding, just months before he split with his old friend to become commander-in-chief of the anti-treaty forces. Dad, who was in charge now of the army and who obviously had great influence in the conduct of the Civil War. He went to the cabinet and he was supported by his army council and he said, we must take drastic action to prevent any further shooting of the people who are representing the people of Ireland and who are supporting the democratic process. And it was he who influenced the cabinet to take out, the, quite illegally, to take out the four prisoners from Mount Joy and shoot them. 
right up to the end of his life, he always maintained that it was the right thing to do. It was state terrorism. It was a repressive response. Um, it was outside the bounds of, of legality. Um, and I guess what they decided was the situation was so grave that they had to take this kind of action. And again, there is this sense that the government doesn't know whether it will survive. There's a real sense of fear and insecurity among government ministers about the ability of the free state to overcome the rebellion and to survive. The key ministers were Kevin O'Higgins, Taoiseach W.T. Cosgrave, General Richard Mulcahy, Owen McNeill and his fellow northerner Ernest Blythe, and Minister for External Affairs Desmond Fitzgerald. The decision they took was one they took uh, um, out of a very strong moral conviction that if they didn't do this, the assassination of deputies by the Republicans might lead to the collapse of parliamentary government and to anarchy. Um, that's not a justification of what they did, it's an explanation, because in living in their time, we have to understand how they approach these things. But uh, he had uh, never any doubts, I think, that it was the right thing to do. You may say he should have had, but that's not his opinion. But he, he did not have any doubts that they saved the state by the action they took. Not everyone was so convinced. Almost for the first time in the Civil War, newspaper editorials and international observers responded critically to the reprisal executions. Among the public, there was a deepening sense of despair. I actually saw the men who did it coming back from wherever they did it, and they were swinging their revolvers. I saw a couple of soldiers there standing drinking tea. I suppose it was tea, it was the morning, of course. And a little way at the side, I saw a soldier kneeling in the sentry box. Whoever he was, I suppose he knew the men who had been executed. And there was a gloom over the prison, or over, over the whole city that day. There was a dark cloud. I wouldn't approve of it. I'd arrest them, and I'd keep them there until such time as there could be some other decision made. But I don't think, I don't think that they could ever take them out and shoot them. The Civil War was now barely a war at all, more a series of sporadic acts of sabotage carried out by a handful of anti-treaty activists and aimed principally at blocking the movement of government troops. Railway lines were destroyed, engines derailed, bridges blown up and stations and signal cabins wrecked. Arrests and executions were the government's response to this dwindling guerrilla campaign which nevertheless did huge damage to a fragile economy. Bitterness and viciousness were now permanent features of the civil war fighting. Anti-treaty units such as this one remained as fiercely opposed to the treaty as they'd ever been. In one incident in County Wexford the commander of an anti-treaty unit outraged even his own men when they came across a government officer and troops in a public house not long after the Mountjoy executions. The officer tried to draw a gun and he fired a few shots at him with the machine gun and knocked him down and then proceeded to dress up his wounds. The others all surrendered. And then he brought out four, on, four of the others now. They were just, just common soldiers. He brought one of them after another out to the backyard and, and, and killed them, killed them with, this, with, the, with the Thompson gun. I, I left Wexford after that. I thought that was something that was, was totally, totally disgraceful. I was having my breakfast in the morning and this man came and sat beside me. And uh, he said, I said, good morning. He said, yeah, yes. He said, I'm just uh, after executing a man now, he said. This was the man who was in charge. Completely as if he was just doing his day's work, you know. It's, he was so casual about it. This was a man who spent another four years in France. And he had just come from the execution. But he, then you see that they... they 
blow the brains of the man out, then the officer has to do that. When the man is shot down, the officer approaches him and blows his brains out to finish his, his tribulation, you know. Executions were alleged also in Sligo. The anti-treaty side claimed that six men had been shot after their arrest by government troops on the slopes of Ben Bulban. One of the men who died had two brothers serving in the Free State Army. He, though, had gone against the treaty. His name, Brian McNeil, a young university student from Dublin. Most remarkable of all, perhaps, Brian McNeil's father was the Minister for Education, Owen McNeil. Brian's sister still recalls the day the family learned of his death. They were surprised when they came into the avenue that my father was standing on the doorsteps. They were up a couple of steps, about seven or eight, and waiting for them. And when they got there, he said to my mother, Taddy, I want to talk to you. And the pair of them went into the study. And that was when he broke the news about Brian? And that Brian. was when he broke the news about Brian. My mother was desperately shattered. Again, amongst eight children, we always reckoned she had two favourites. Not that she wasn't nice to the rest of us, but Brian, who was a blonde, and Moira, who was a blonde. And these were her pets. And what I heard was that she was utterly shattered. Remote mountain regions were now the only refuge for the anti-treaty activists as the civil war dragged mercilessly on. Mostly, this was due to one man. Liam Lynch was the leader of the IRA executive and remained fanatically opposed to any surrender or ceasefire, despite overwhelming evidence that the anti-treaty cause was hopeless. Moves within the IRA leadership to end the fighting failed to impress Lynch. Equally, he paid little heed to de Valera, treating him as just another soldier. In March 1922, at a meeting of the IRA, deep in Lynch's stronghold territory of the Nair Valley in North Waterford, in this farm cottage, he persuaded his weary commanders to fight on. His whole judgment must have gone, because when he was traipsing around the Knockbeal Downs a few days before he was killed, and he only had a handful of people supporting him and the war had virtually finished, he still was writing to people to say that they would win in the end if they held out. I think the war should have been concluded by Lynch in December of 1922. Uh, I think it was a mistake to carry on because uh, he, he, it must have been aware to him and his other commanders that they were beaten on the field. All major towns, the entire country was occupied. There simply was no reason to go on. And uh, I think he made a mistake that by withdrawing to the hillsides and the valleys that he could have continued a, a sort of war that they conducted against the British, and that simply wasn't done. Lynch's death, like that of Collins, was a critical moment in the Civil War. He had been the embodiment of the anti-treaty position throughout the conflict. Idealistic, impractical, almost spiritual in his devotion to the Republican cause. In Liam Lynch's world, death had to come before dishonour. For the country as a whole, Lynch probably had to die before this pointless war could be brought to an end. Lynch personified all that was honest and decent, and that it was no wonder that he took the path that he did, because he couldn't live with compromise, he couldn't live with the new free state. De Valera wrote when he heard of his death, he wrote that Liam Lynch threw himself across the stampede of a nation. Even Lynch, whose memorial stands today in the Knockmeal Down Mountains, might have realised that no other outcome was possible. Peace terms offered by the IRA were rejected by the government. One minister remarked that there's not going to be a draw with a replay in the autumn. The futile mountain guerrilla campaign ended with a ceasefire in May 1923. No arms were handed in, they were merely dumped. Dave couldn't take it seeing Irishmen killing Irishmen. And he called a halt. And I can always remember my brother coming in that night. 
en su mujer de ver o el su mujer y se te un de chía en crédito se te un juez de 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 what did we fight for and after a bit he to go to the revolver and with my younger brother they went out to the garden and buried the revolver Dave told him bury him for another time it's in some future time it would start again and we would win through Much more than guns were buried after Ireland's civil war. In Dublin's Glasnevin Cemetery lie the remains of hundreds of free state soldiers, largely forgotten victims of the madness from within. No one knows how many people died in the nine months of fighting, certainly thousands. And it was rarely a conflict blessed by chivalry and honour. This was a poisonous and very typical civil war, potmarked by brutality and atrocities, particularly in Kerry in the final throes of the fighting. At Knocknagoshal in March 1923, six Free State soldiers died in a booby trap explosion. The next day at nearby Ballysidi, eight anti-treaty prisoners were strapped to a landmine by their Free State captors and blown to pieces. The military options so heavily exercised at the birth of the Irish Free State left little to recommend them. But giving in to the violence of the IRA in 1922 could have produced an even greater catastrophe. Politics tragically failed to deliver also, most notably in the figure of the anti-treaty side's chief political apologist. And how well does the record now stand of those who succeeded Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins? Was anything genuinely achieved by so much bloodshed? I think there were real problems with the Free State. I think they excluded groups. I think it was... Um, a very, sometimes they had a very narrow outlook. Their attitudes towards women leave a lot to be desired. But in terms of establishing the state on a firm democratic footing, I think we have to give them full marks. The fact that you have disturbance and an unres unresolved constitutional position 75 years on, that is evident, evidence that the treaty settlement was inadequate in the first place and didn't stand the test of time. So in fact, I, I would contend that they both got it wrong. The treaty settlement was a poor settlement. The state had been founded and therefore it was wrong to rise against the state, against your fellow Irishmen. It didn't alter the border by a millimetre. It was one of the most useless wars ever fought since uh, Swift wrote about the big enders and the little enders having the row over which end of the egg should be topped. I think it has been proved right since. There's about three or four thousand killed since up in the north of Ireland between policemen and civilians and everything else. Whereas if it was all settled at that time, you wouldn't have that now, would you? You'd get, and you'd have a great country. However great a country Ireland may now be, several basic political and constitutional questions remain unsettled 75 years after the Civil War. The modern IRA claims a direct line of descent from the men and women who opposed the treaty in 1922, still a minority claiming to represent the Irish people. By force of arms, if necessary, we may have learnt almost nothing. One lesson that we could learn would be the need for democratic governments responsible to the people to take firm measures against those who deny majority rule and believe that they, however small a minority might be, might represent the Irish people.
Democracy is imperfect, as we all know. It was in 1922. It is now at the end of the 90s. But it's better than militaristic alternatives. I think the real legacy from the Civil War is a model of Irish history. Uh, a model of Irish history which involves a legend of the st a stab in the back, to use a German phrase, that uh, he who compromises is a traitor and that all negotiation involves a sellout. And we must not repeat the great mistake of 1921. Uh, Northern IRA, Provo history begins with the great sellout, as they see it, of 1921. And that sellout must not be repeated. And he who negotiates is immediately under suspicion, automatically. And this has dogged the provisional IRA for the last 25 years. Anyone who's been set up to negotiate has had to retreat back into the fold, uh, shouting orthodoxies of various kinds to prove that he is as hard against the British and, uh, and in favour of the freedom struggle as everybody else. And it's only in the last five years or so that that mentality has begun to break down in the face of a very hard, cruel set of facts. But their war is unwinnable. We are the party that puts people before politics, the party of all the people. We are Fianna Fáil. The outstanding legacy of the civil war for Ireland's political system is the two-party framework which emerged from the conflict. Two large blocs, two substantial political machines, today separated more by history than by policy, still owing their existence to the split in Sinn Féin of 75 years ago. I ask the Republican movement, don't procrastinate any longer. Make up your minds. Politics is the way you solve problems. You'll never solve division through violence. Desmond Fitzgerald served in Ireland's first government. His son reflects on the political legacy of the Civil War. We can't be grateful for something which was so terrible in its impact on that society and that generation, and which has had abiding consequences in terms of continuing violence in the island, probably. In fact, there was a civil war has certainly contributed to the continued existence of an IRA in some form. So you can't be grateful for that. But on the other hand, uh, when once it happened and two large blocks emerged, it, those blocks have protected us from the ravages of ideology which did such damage in Europe in the 30s and which were still in Britain in the 80s, you know, uh, because of the ideological position of, of Margaret Thatcher and the Conservatives, still capable of doing damage. We haven't had those disadvantages here, so there are, you know, some s positive consequences as well as the appalling negative consequences at the time. Uh, on the North, Fianna Fáil are better on the North, are better on the whole concept of Ireland uh, and uh, the unity that we would aspire to, uh, to have in a democratic and constitutional way, uh, as distinct from Fine Gael, um, who appeared to be, us, to us, to be sort of a, of a two-nation party. Uh, and that, I think, would be the basic difference between the two parties, and that, as I say, would be, as you would describe it, the legacy uh, of the Civil War and, and, and the War of Independence, less so. But I would like to see a reconciliation of the post-Civil War political parties coming together, and I think if that happens, uh, I think that the unity of our country is nearer uh, in historical terms and further. My tradition would not be to go in with Fianna Fáil. I don't begrudge them anything and if they keep going for five years and make a success of the country, so best for everybody. Um, I don't quite trust them. I never will, I probably. That's my tradition, that's the way I was brought up. But if they make the law, I'll keep the law, whether I like it or not. Bridget Hogan O'Higgins' suspicion of what she would see as her traditional political enemy is perhaps not so surprising. Her father, Patrick Hogan, was a member of the Cabinet, which prosecuted the Civil War on behalf of the Free State. She witnessed at first hand the residue of bitterness which the fighting left behind. When I was first elected in 57, I was quite shocked at the level of bitterness in the Dáil. But in hindsight, I can now understand it. You still had De Valera in the Dáil and the Mass. Dan Breen, Oscar Trainer, all of these on, on the Fianna Fáil side. On our side, you John Costello, Sean McKeown, um, Dick Mulcahy, and a number of Civil War people, you see. And, and the bitterness was quite incredible. To me, this wasn't, wasn't used to bitterness. 
A legacy of hatred and suspicion, countless deaths, an enormous financial cost for the newborn free state. A model of Irish history sanctioning the taking of arms against majority rule. It's difficult now to draw any credit as a nation from the history of Ireland's civil war. But it may be even more foolish to try to ignore it. Trying to, I think, um, ascribe motives either to de Valera or to the Cosgrevites is really something of an obscenity. Uh, de Valera was wrong in what he did. Uh, they were wrong in some of what they did. But if any of us were faced with the same situation today, what would we do? I have no regrets for anything I ever done. No whatsoever. I do. If it had to be done again, I'd do it. All the older people regret anything that ever happened during that civil war. And I hope that the younger generation, I never want to see one of them join in in that. Let them say, for God's sake, pray for God to help them make a good decision over the table rather than war. When Liam Lynch fell here high up in the Knockmeal Down Mountains in April 1923, the Civil War was as good as over. Its legacy, however, took decades to overcome. Perhaps Mary Robinson was right in 1990 when she applauded Ireland for finally stepping out from behind the faded flags of the Civil War. But if we as a nation have indeed put the events of 75 years ago behind us, then perhaps this black and bitter period of Ireland's recent past still offers lessons that are best remembered and not forgotten. Next Wednesday at half past nine, you can see Kavanagh QC.